I'm Claire Edwards from Brain Smart People Development, and you're listening to Authentic Leadership, a series of conversations, insights, and inspirations with leaders who are real, raw, and authentic. Today, I bring you part two of my conversation with Yasser Nasseri, an Iranian refugee, with a story to tell. Please, if you happen to have stumbled upon this episode and haven't listened to part one, stop now, <laughs> head off to listen to episode 36, and then come back here and all will make sense. Part two, Australia, the land of hope, focuses on Yasser's journey to Australia from Indonesia. And it's filled not with just hope, but so many characteristics, persistence, desire, taking action, um, really stepping out of your comfort zone and holding a vision for the future that is global. You will notice during this interview a slight difference in my voice as I was, I was battling a heavy cold. Enjoy. Well, hello again, Yasser. Welcome back. How are you? Hello, Claire. I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me again. So last episode, Yasser, we covered your story of leaving Iran and the many attempts it took you to arrive in Australia, but more so the trauma of your boat capsizing and that tragic loss of life that you and the loved ones of the victims had to deal with. But now I'm happy to say we're moving into more hopeful times. And as you said at the end of episode one, Australia, the land of hope. <laughs> sure, sure it is, sure it is. So look, let's start um, where we left off. So, uh, you know, you started to tell us that you'd arrived in Brisbane. So can you share sort of what what were your early experiences of of being in a completely new country and and i suppose realizing that finally you were safe so um even remembering that kind of um that moment is kind of exciting mm -hmm. um, i exactly remember the day i um took uh, the airplane, you know, from Indonesia and, and got into the plane. And I remember I was sitting with passengers. I was alone and I was crying and nobody oh. knew why I'm crying. But it was like a kind of a happy crying and a bit of sad crying because I was leaving my second kind of home or somewhere that I was kind of built some relationship with. Mm -hmm. And now I'm very joyful to go to my destination or somewhere that you know I can start my life all over again after all those three and a you know few months waiting in Indonesia. So uh, because I came through UNHCR, uh, there is process in place. So I had to go where the government says for the first month, mm -hmm. I get some support, caseworker and stuff, and then I could choose which city I want to go and live. So my first destination was Brisbane. So I had a stop in Sydney change plane go to brisbane so literally the first city that i visited or landed was brisbane <laughs> and um and uh, i remember um in uh, i was in a program and they asked me about what was uh, kind of a shock the first kind of shock when you arrived in australia or what you didn't expect i said well I, when i came to australia my my head was around something like new york and then now I'm in Brisbane going from airport to Salisbury, which is suburbs out of the CBD uh -huh. uh, in the middle of bush. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was asking that person who picked me up, uh, the caseworker who picked me up from airport, uh, from this settlement organization. On the way, we were uh, driving and, you know, uh, we were going to put me in my place or wherever it was. I asked, where are the buildings? <laughs> he said, <"Did> <laughs> <laughs> I said, where is the city? Where is that? Because, and I told him my imagination or my expectation, I kind of built in my head. And he said, no, it's not like that, mate. <laughs> so. Oh, sorry. We had a, a bit of a technical glitch there. Um, so where were we? <laughs> um, yeah. You, you asked your caseworker where the buildings were because yeah. <laughs> you, you were in a city. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we, uh, they, you know, uh, he picked me up from airport, 
um, and I had a bit, little luggage and then um, they took me to my new place, which was out of uh, Brisbane, a suburb called Salisbury. I think it was like half an hour from the city. So mm-hmm. I didn't see the city at all. And now from Jakarta, a crazy, busy city, I'm in Australia in the middle of kind of bush in Salisbury mm-hmm. in, a, in a big house. And I got the one room. And all alone. <laughs> so, oh wow! So there weren't there weren't other refugees in in the house. So I have to give a bit of um, story here. Like, so when refugees come through UNHCR, which is which is a great program. Like, you arrive, you got the caseworker pick you up, and for first months you have a free room until okay. you get sorted. So you you're assigned to a caseworker. You get a free months. Uh, one month free um, accommodation and they register you with all the agencies you need and then you go from there. And then after one month, if you are on your own with the help of caseworker, you can find your place and and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a plan. So I arrived, they took me to that place and because I was single, it was a share house. I got one room in 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 a kind of a big house. And when I arrived, the other housemate, which happened to be refugees as well, they weren't home. So I don't know they, ah. where they were. So I was alone sitting there and I was happy and sad. It's a, it's a very strange feeling. It's, mm. it's, you have it both, you know, you, you, I was very um, emotional and uh, homesick, I can say. Yeah. Now I am homesick toward two places. Not only yeah. one, it was missing Iran on top of that, I'm missing Indonesia more. So because I just left there, right? And all of my friends and the, the, the belonging, the attachment I built with that country and people are gone. So now I'm in a very new place, which I'm super happy about. But the pain was more fresh. The, the sadness was kind of fresh, you know, like yeah. you, you miss all those friends and, 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 and place. And, you know, it's like a feeling of homesickness, I guess. <laughs> Well, I, I, I mean, I suspect that a lot of the time in Indonesia, you were in survival mode um, and, you, and you didn't feel mm-hmm. safe. So you had to focus on that. But here you are safe. And I suppose the realization hits you. Your family's back in Iran, your friends in Indonesia. You don't know anybody here. It must have been so many mixed thoughts and emotions for you Def- definitely and 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 on top of that um the, the message that it's you, you know all over again start from scratch mm. let's do it <laughs> yeah yeah and and so when you arrived in brisbane um what was your level of what was your level of english and how what were your plans to sort of assimilate and integrate well, the good thing about, I mean, it was really sad that they stuck in Indonesia and the plan, you know, I couldn't arrive like the other refugees. Um, and, you know, I stuck there for three and a half years. But the good thing about that was I built a bit of English skills, you know, because, mm. I mean, there was no school or, you know, I couldn't even afford it. But because I was mingling with these foreigner people like Americans and Indonesian Americans or people who are speaking English there, Mm-hmm. built a bit of uh, kind of language skill so I could speak English to do my daily stuff okay but nothing academic or or any preparation to go to uni or something but it was good enough to you know, to go by with okay so tell me about this first month and and sort of what you had to organize and arrange and what your thoughts were around the next steps i suppose well again um the first day or few first like days were a bit tough because again all those mixed feelings and thoughts but after a while you know i I know where i was and i was very happy you know it's like a destination now i'm free and at I, I, at least i can start planning for my life because in indonesia that wasn't the case mm-hmm. um so I knew I want to study or, you know, at least I want to do my English because I I want my English to be okay because I want to live here and it is my kind of destination. Now I got my freedom. I'm going to settle here. So, of course, the first thing you think is 
I have to improve my English skills. And then my caseworker said there is some programs here available for you you can use, which unfortunately some refugees don't use. But I was very keen, so I um, signed up with TAFE right away mm-hmm. and start my uh, my English program, which was like ter- the certificate, like two, three, and I was involved. So I was like a full time English study uh, a student to to study English. Mm-hmm. And on the side, after a while, I start doing some volunteering because I've heard it's really good to, you know, help your English to be better, mm. uh, to build a network. So I went with like Red Cross in Brisbane. I did a few months internship there. I had like a work placement through TAFE in a cafe down the road. I did that. So any opportunity would come up. I would get involved anything with the society that helped me to kind of build a network or make friends or practice my English. So that was all my plan every day. And I also like volunteer with um, immigration. Um, there was a, like a legal place and yeah. wise uh, refugees, asylum seekers and migrants. And I would go in the evening and do their, their, their admin work. So a lot of volunteer work and a lot of TAFE. So it was all my life there. For the, wow. Like, and how long was that for? Uh, so Brisbane, Brisbane was fun. I, I love Brisbane. I have to admit that. Um, <laughs> I had a very good memory with good people, good friends, good support. Um, and I, as I'm talking now, I miss Brisbane. <laughs> I should go visit. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love the river, South Bank. But, but the, so the f- f- when I arrived and they put me on that house, which, you know, I want to see. I'm a very outgoing city person. Mm. helped me through my journey a lot um so i went and figure out the city and explore the city a bit and then after my one month was up i moved to west end which is next right to the city yeah yeah and tafe is in south bank so i would walk to tafe every day so for 18 months i was there doing volunteer work full-time english study and just exploring and um I knew my plan was going to uni and study. Um, and um, I came to Sydney for a visit. I remember I, I had a few friends in Sydney and they asked me, I'll come at least for a visit. And then it was very normal, right? I'm in Australia already kind of 18 months. I want to go see another cities. So mm-hmm. I went to Sydney, I never forget. Um, my friend took me to CBD Sydney and we went through Parramatta Road and we passed University of Sydney and I never forget that scenery like i saw the the sign on the wall uh, you know the lion and university of sydney yeah yeah <laughs> and, oh my god that's a great uni i wish i could study here so it was like a little quick thought and and it was gone and then i explored sydney and said oh it's very much like jakarta or tehran in terms of busyness and you know it's mm-hmm. crazy and you know there's more people and more happening here so i went back to brisbane packed up and moved to no, moved to Sydney. So that was my story with Brisbane. <laughs> it uh-huh. was like months. And I remember my uh, Aussie friend in Brisbane said, are you crazy? You want to move to Sydney? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not, <that's- laughs> Not many Queenslanders want to move down. <laughs> and they were, because it seems very simple and easy to me. And I just, to be honest, I just packed with another refugee. I, yeah. I still have the photo. We packed in the back of a car. Whole of our life was in the back of a, uh, a car. Um, a few luggage and few, um, you know, stuff. Putting oh, in the back wow. of the car and we drove all the way to Sydney and that's it. Um, I was in Sydney. So new journey begun. Wow. Okay. So, so chapter two, Sydney. Um, <laughs> tell me about how, you know, what what did you do how how did you get you know what did you think about studying what did you want to study just tell me so i i i had diploma industrial electric diploma back home and you know i had some people here said well you you can be electrician easily i said well i know with my diploma i can do a little course and be electrician it's a good money but you know that's not i want to be and um, I, I want to study. I want to go to uni. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I knew they didn't accept, uh, I, they don't accept my diploma. Mm-hmm. So I said, what What are my options? And 
you know, Taif said, but there is a course called tertiary preparation course. It's for adults. You do for one year. And if you got a good numbers, like you with, with points or whatever, you pass it, then you have options to choose from different uni. And then if your application ap- accepted, you can go to uni, but you have to do that first year, one year. Yeah. So I had around 20 months English study. And now I signed up a tertiary preparation course. They call it T, uh, TCP or TP, TPC. Mm-hmm. TPC course at TAFE Ultimo, right in the heart of city. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was not New York, but it was very close. <laughs> but, I know where Ultimo is, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I love the city and everything. So I was living in Parramatta. So... Part of my volunteer work was with different churches. I would go on Sunday and make coffee because that was an opportunity to become a barista. I did that in Brisbane. So I had a bit of barista skills. So when I moved to Sydney, I signed up for a TPC course at TAFE Ultima, which was a full-time one-year course. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning, I would go in Surrey Hills and make coffee in the cafe because now I'm a kind of a semi-barista. Mm-hmm. So that was my life. Paramata, I would wake up like 5 a.m., go to train station, come to city, 6 a.m. at work in Surrey Hills, uh, making coffee until 12, 12, go to Ultimo, doing my English study or TPC course until 6, 6 to 7, 8, you know, mingling around in library or somewhere, studying and then going home. And that was my everyday <laughs> life. Wow. Um, they were they were long days, which was fun. I you know I loved it. Um, uh, it was it was uh, kind of a cornerstone of where I am at now, I guess. Mm. And so, when you took your TPC exam, did you pass first time or? Yes, uh, unlike university, I never failed the subject, and I have here to thank TAFE counselors. Uh, I think. It's, I mean, I mean, it's, given my journey, it's very important who you ask advice for, yeah. or, you know, who advises you, who you um, ask questions about different stuff. And Tave, for example, there was a counselor, she knew my story and she helped me to put the application in. And on top of that, I had no, I had no clue. And she said, there is a refugee application for scholarship only for refugees do you want to apply i said well i'm a refugee why not (laughs) so Ah. she introduced that to me plus the application that usually people use after tpc there is an application you put there you have nine options nine degree nine university and then it goes to that center which i forgot the name and then if you're if an university agrees you know you they pick you up and they offer you a, a, a course Mm-hmm. So on top of that, she put that refugee application as well. So my first, I, I had nine options. I remember I put only four and it was all business studies with different unis. And the first uni was Sydney, University of Sydney, which I saw in Parramatta Road. I shared with you earlier, right? Yeah. It was like first choice was University of Sydney, Bachelor of Commerce, <laughs> which was Bachelor of Business. Wow. That's a bit different from um, industrial electric. Yeah, exactly. That, that, <laughs> work on that field i always wanted to to study business and you know i've run a few little businesses back home as well and i was interested so here i am you know finishing almost finishing tpc and put the application forward and that advisor in tape really helped me thanks to her wherever she is hopefully she listened to this one day (laughs) i hope so the uh the result came out the first option was agreed upon so i kind of Got the offer from University of Sydney. I got a placement plus the scholarship. Tell me about what that was like that day that you, was it a letter or a phone call? Or... I think it was an email at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't even understand it. I asked one of my <laughs> Aussie, fr- Aussie friends <laughs> and <laughs> forwarded the email to her. And she said, oh, congratulations. She, she called me. She said, I'm so happy for you. I said, what happened? <laughs> And then she explained, hey, you got a place for Bachelor of Commerce at University of Sydney, which is a very good university. Plus, you got a scholarship, which is a, it's not a full scholarship, but they give you a bit of money each semester. Okay. And uh, it helps you, you know, to go forward with the study. And yeah, I was super excited. And 
um yeah it was it was great but again um as the other part of my journey is always mixed there's no there's mm. never one feeling or a certain thing it's like oh okay i'm excited i'm accept that but i'm fearful if i fail because i'm going now competing with these aussie girls and boys who grew up here you know ah. they you know they they, they know the, the system they know the language they know how to do the assignment and i have no clue <laughs> <laughs> so, so you felt a bit of pressure as well oh definitely definitely and then the pressure was real when i actually got into the lecture rooms and tutors and i and oh, even the system is different it's not only language it's the system of a study is different here which mm. to learn and then until you learn these things you're behind of the other subjects so it was very stressful <laughs> yeah you have to learn the system of learning exactly it's totally different from middle east <laughs> And are there services offered at uni to help you with the whole process of of study? Yeah, definitely. University of Sydney, I mean, the scholarship was very helpful because, you know, um, I was helping family. I had to work to pay my rent, you know. So that scholarship helped me to take off a bit of, get rid of those pressure a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I could have more time to focus on a study. Plus, there was a lot of um, workshops and tutorials and other teachers and lectures were so helpful so um yeah although it was a really stressful journey in university was especially for me you know as an older adult going to uni starting all over again with new language it was pretty difficult Mm -hmm. but but and I failed a few subjects but you know as you know I never give up so (laughs) no you don't yes sir no I passed them I passed them all so um, very helpful environment, I, I can say. And and did you make friends at uni? Were you able to integrate um, into the culture? Well, I integrate to the culture in different ways, but not specifically in uni, I have to be honest. Mm-hmm. And it's not because of uni or something. I think it's because of age different, because a lot of those students are leaving high school, coming to uni. Yeah. Now I am. I have a very different story, different age you know i'm from different categories so mm-hmm. it was a bit hard but here and there you know i had um i had good friends and uh yeah would sit and chat and go to these events but again not as you know as a student who leave your high school and come to yeah uni. yeah it was a very different journey plus I, I was busy with you know work after uni and doing other stuff and how how long was your degree and and what year did you graduate? Well, I think my degree is supposed to be three years, but because it was so difficult, I think I finished it about four years. Mm-hmm. Um, That's okay. You did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fine. And then um, at the end, COVID happened. So it was early COVID kind of. Ah. Yeah. Um, which was very difficult because I was kind of almost graduating and I was a start looking for jobs, a um, lot of applications. And, and I found resume writing and cover letters was the most difficult things in Australia for me. Mm. Very challenging, very, very hard and very stressful uh, process. So I was like sending heaps of resume here and there, plus a studying, plus Corona happened. And then in the early Corona, I, I lost my mom as well. So it was it was a bit of chaos oh my goodness i'm sorry to hear that yeah no no problem um so um uh, yeah i finished it i think uh yeah early corona my uni was uh kind of uh, complete mm-hmm. um and i had to wait for my graduation until later to be able to go to the ceremony of course oh gosh there's so yeah, that must have been another experience with mixed emotions, I, I would think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> I've learned that pretty kind of well that it, I think it's all, all about life, right? It, it's never, mm. certain. I mean, it's always mixed things. Everything comes to your way. It's good and there is bad things into it as well. So, yeah. So tell me how you, you said, you know, you, the resume writing and, and the applications and everything, which is complex, quite complex for everybody here. Um, how did you land work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I have to mention that here. Um, I mean, 
through my journey, I mean, I, even in Indonesia, which I shared in part one, there are a lot of people or organizations that help me. Mm-hmm. In Indonesia, especially people, I have to really acknowledge them. Uh, I'll really thank them, really supportive. Or um, I couldn't make it without their presence, I, I believe. I hear the same story with different people and organization that helped me to kind of move forward, giving me more hope on like not giving up and, um, you know, figure out my ability if I, if it makes sense. So mm-hmm. I remember um, I was, for example, University of Sydney has a career center. So I was using that. So I was very like searching, you know, I was searching for opportunity all the time. So mm-hmm. I use all the resources that was available at uni, which was very helpful with resume writing and cover letter. And then I remember one day I was searching and then about refugee or opportunity or internship, something like that. And then uh, career seekers came up. Ah, career seekers. Yeah. Career seekers came up. Yeah. I had no clue what it is. And yeah. there was a form. I said, well, I'm a refugee. They do work for refugees so let's sign up and i was like you know just out of clue like i had no idea so I just signed up and it was after a while that i got an email from them again i had no really clue what they really do and uh they asked me to to go to to an event or to a workshop or something like that and that's my journey start with query seekers which was one of the best thing happened to me in australia i believe uh, and I start from them, and it was um, it was like a lot of engagement, and they invite us to a lot of workshop, mic interview, resume writing, uh, spotlight, different events, which was which was phenomenal, which was great for a person like me who is about to graduate, mm. doesn't know the system. Uh, you know, it's the same thing. I, I didn't know the system of university. Now I don't know the system of cooperation here, so I have to yeah, know all yeah. these things. <laughs> Uh, or as you guys say, reading between the lines, right? So, <laughs> so Quercicus was very, very, very helpful. And I start doing internship in Qantas through them. So they helped me to land an internship opportunity in Qantas. So I did three rotation of uh, marketing internship with Qantas loyalty as well, um, which was again a good a good experience or good icebreak for me to understand how things works here and get prepared um, uh, with the local experience to to find a full-time job and so um after your internship with Qantas what was the next step (laughs) my plan was okay I did three internship with Qantas through career seekers great it was amazing and I built like relationship there and I was planning kind of to find a job and now going for a full-time opportunity and then COVID happened and then uh. what one of the biggest company was heated was Qantas so now no hope going back to Qantas kind of give up uh, and I start again looking for jobs and then career seekers called me one night one of that sorry one of that voice called me and said there is an opportunity. Uh, it's not exactly what you study, but would you consider it? I said, no question asked. Sign me yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll consider anything. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. And it, was a, it was not too far from what I said. I mean, I studied marketing and uh, business analytics, double major, but uh, it was like a sales support role in a mm-hmm. Ruby kind of environment uh, in Blackwoods, which is part of the West Farmers. Again, I said, well, I'm, I'm up for it. I've been sending like over 50, 60 resumes so far. So um, I'll, I'll go. So I went for an interview and then um, I got the job. I got the job as a, um, they call it national sales enablement role, uh, which was an interior level. Uh, and it was from uh, West Farmers Refugee Intake. Okay. Yeah. So they took me in and then um, I started working as a full-time kind of person after uni and um, experiencing different kind of style of life <laughs> in Australia. So when did you start at Blackwoods? Oh, it was uh, two and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two and a half years ago, exactly, because now I'm with them, yeah, for about two and a half years, yeah. 
almost three years. Um, and I believe there's been a promotion since that time you've been with Blackwoods. <laughs> yes, thanks for reminding. Um, yes, yeah, so I joined the Blackwoods as, um, you know, kind of entry level role as a sales support. And um, on the way, like about a year ago, I was promoted to a marketing role. Mm-hmm. Which now I'm marketing activation lead uh, at Blackwoods. So I work in a marketing department, which is great. And it's closer to what I've studied as well. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you very much. With the help of, you know, people like yourself, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And tell me about, I mean, we're, we're connected through an amazing social enterprise called Glow Up Careers. Tell me about your connection with Glow Up and Devon and how you met her and some of the things that you're working on together now. Yes, um, thanks for bringing it up. Um, Yvonne has been one of those people who has inspired me a lot and give me a lot of hope and give me, uh, I always say, she she show me what's possible, mm. uh, which is great. Um, so I always have this discussion with her. I don't know exactly in what point we met, but I'm sure it was in some refugee event or something career seeker related or mm-hmm. something like that. I, I don't exactly, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe she's in a better place to re- remind me, but um, uh, yeah, we, along the way we met and then um, she started helping me with the uh, career coaching. So she's my career coach. like mm-hmm. mentor, And she has been very helpful in this journey. So all these things happened. She was on the background helping me with resume, with my LinkedIn, uh, with my pitch and uh, with the way that I'm planning for my career and going forward and going, for example, from sales role, going to marketing department now. So she has been on a background helping me a lot and advising me um, in, on, on my career journey. And then uh, again, I'm not exactly sure at what point, but obviously she knew my story and then we start sharing stories because she's in HR, uh, human resource space. And mm-hmm. also helping refugees and asylum seekers getting job or helping them with their career, um, you know, advices. And then now I have a story. So we start sharing our story in different platforms. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, I I always share about uh, how difficult it is for refugees to find jobs and what are the barriers. And then she share her story, how she came to Australia and built her company or enterprise, and then how she can help refugees um, to get jobs. And then we kind of promote this idea to companies, how to kind of ease this process and be more inclusive to and hire more refugees uh, in their workplace. So that's kind of developed along the way on a side of full-time work. Mm-hmm. And we went in a good platform, like uh, we were invited in Microsoft or KPMG or Social Good Summit in Melbourne. And uh, in August, um, uh, next month, we are going to a big event in Hamilton Island um, to to share our story and kind of encourage all these corporations to, to start thinking about hiring more refugees in their workplace. So that's one thing also that I, I do on side with her and she has been uh, really motivational in that space for me as well. And uh, the little I know of you, Yasa, I, I would imagine that you, that you really do enjoy speaking to, to large groups and getting your message out there. Uh, yes, with broken English, yes. <laughs> I think, yeah, hey, look. So, I, 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 is your mother tongue Farsi or is it a different... No, Farsi, Persian, yes. Yeah, okay. So you, your English is always going to be better than our Farsi. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, yeah. yeah. Well, I, that's the other thing. Um, there, there are a few things. Uh, for example, I never knew that the story can change or become something that I can use it for good yeah and that's one of the things Yvonne has uh, showed me how to do that and she has been helping on that space as well a lot which is again I'm always saying that she tell me or show me what's possible uh, which is great um, and also uh, the power of the storytelling and 
personally for me who went through all those difficulties and adversities um now seeing that those store that story with all those challenges can be meaningful for people and can help an idea to kind of pushing an idea forward it's it's a bit um kind of rewarding it's a bit uh fulfilling you know if it makes sense oh a- absolutely completely and you know when you were talking about in the last episode about being a voice that you're also a voice for the people who who didn't make it and and all those refugees who don't make it and i think you know from the messages that 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 you put out there also about you know that 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 refugees and asylum seekers are an amazing untapped pool of of talent of of potential and you know and i can't imagine uh, and i've you know dealt with a few refugees myself through glow up how challenging it must be that you've studied you've got a degree you've worked professionally for so many years in an area and then um and this is I, I have to be careful what i say here because i'm not saying that one job is better than another but but when your only opportunity is to clean places or to 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 make coffees and it must be very it must be very difficult and and, and this comes back to the the essence of hope that you know people like you and Yvonne will will keep giving people hope and so that they don't lose touch with those dreams would you agree yeah, definitely um absolutely um i mean that's what she kind of uh taught me uh, showed me and now what we do together for others and i and i hope uh that's the message from our story sharing or telling and i have i've got a lot of great feedbacks after whenever i share i ask for feedbacks when people come to me and thanks and and from those feedbacks i see the impact of the story and mm. our people are hopeful um they get something out of it um and i think that's uh, that's a purpose that's a purpose today for me that you know you have a, a story you went through something extraordinary and now sharing it with others can help them to you know change their perspective or giving them hope you know different people take it i mean i i had the challenge and i still have sometimes to go and share a story in different platform with different audience and i was thinking what what is my message and i stopped i've i've been trying to stop asking that question for myself because that might mm. not my business anymore so my business is sharing my story in my full potential putting it out there and people with different needs take the whatever they need um, exactly that's been my experience yeah exactly you just share your story and people will take from it what they need to hear um the uh, you know the the hope the opportunity the possibility whatever it is you've hit the nail on the head yasser it's um it's it's just about getting out there and sharing your story so so people can take from it what what they need um and also i believe that you are now uh, a refugee ambassador yeah yes uh, it's 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 happened recently a few months ago um again through my great networks i think i'm sure um ivan was part of this process <laughs> um, <laughs> an application came through my inbox and i said oh okay an opportunity here why not so i filled the application sent it through to refugee council of australia and i was kind of <clears throat> picked as one of the refugee ambassador for australia so yeah it's a recent kind of a role um it's it's been great um i'm i'm great that you know my purpose was to be a voice for refugees and now i feel i can do it more productively under that title yeah. you're able to live that and so you know looking looking to your future yasa what however that may look to you what hopes do you still hold yeah so uh i hope uh i mean it's a, like you ask about hope uh, or mm. a kind of dream i mean uh, rather than personal ones i guess i would love to see one day 
in the world we don't have asylum seekers that's kind of what i want to say yeah there is no conflict in middle east or africa or other parts of the world that produces or you know push people out of their their home countries Um, i mean when you look at the numbers now like three million asylum seekers in turkey alone it's it's you know it's all it's a lot of life it's a lot of yeah. pieces of life is going to to loss and going to be um you know um and, and there, there are a lot of opportunities to be to, to miss uh there are a lot of kids young people who uh lost a lot of opportunity that they they, they could have in their home country and now they don't have because there are asylum seekers living in poverty somewhere in southeast asia or in turkey so I've lived that experience and I understand it. It's really sad. So I really want someday comes that one day come that we don't have any asylum seekers. We don't need, we don't even need that title. I think that is such an important vision to hold on to. It really is. Um, and so I suppose turning back to the topic of the podcast, which is the essence of hope in leadership. You know, you shared your story as, and that that's a really strong story of self-leadership and, and how you were driven and motivated to, to, to make a better life for yourself. And, and I do hope for your family as well. I'm curious, you know, from maybe from a perspective of, um, leadership either in in business or or our family or or in community or or even causes that that we believe in how do you think we can use the power of hope yasa to 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 affect better change well i think i mean again i'm i think how can i say it I have to be careful here. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, everything is start with hope, right? It's everything. I, I, I personally believe that everything is start within within you, right? It is start always. Yeah. Within you. Any change that happen around you is start within you, and I've experienced that so many times. And hope, hope is uh, part of this. So I guess part of dreaming. To, to see change in my real world, it has to start within me with hope that, okay, yeah. I, I will be able to see this and I'm going to start doing this baby step toward this and it always start with me. And, be, and, and, and imagine if everyone thinks that way, we're going to have a better, better world to live, right? Because we always think somebody else has to come and start doing something. Mm. And then when you hold that hope and start practicing it within you, then it encourages you to to start those baby steps and again mm-hmm. if everyone think that way it, it gonna create a lot of change don't you think so uh, absolutely absolutely and i think you know in listening to your story in episode one it was you know it was a classic case of resilience that every time you got knocked back every time you fell down you got back up again and it was, okay, what's the next step that I can take? And just holding on to that vision, to that knowledge that you could have a future that was safe and free and, and to keep going. And I think just, you know, by, by listening to your story, I think other people can, it, it can um, ignite that flame of hope within them to to take action however small those steps are um you certainly inspired me <laughs> uh thank you and yeah you know i just i just wish you every ounce of 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 success and and happiness and luck <laughs> and love and for, for what you're hoping for yourself um for your wider community, for refugees and asylum seekers in total, and, and for your family, Yasser. Um, I, I really hope that you're going to be able to, um, to to bring them over and be a complete family again. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, I I have a big hope, I have big dreams, <laughs> and I'm very positive toward that. Um, 
and I and I've understood and I've learned along the way that I mean it's not one dimension it's always multi-dimension you know it's not mm-hmm. only hope you have to do action you have to start doing goods as well yeah following that hope of course starting with hope and maintaining it is a hard thing you know sometimes to ignite is a bit that maybe easier but to maintain that hope from going forward um, I think it's a harder job which I guess we all have to practice and how did you maintain it? How do you maintain it? I guess it's been very difficult. Some, some, Of course, some days you lose it. Some days, especially my stories, there was the time that you just really want to give up because you're mentally tired. Mm. But I guess the, the concept of keep it today, like just today just yeah but now sometimes even not today even shorter period of time just now you, you have to do it now you have to do the the first step don't think about the 10th or 15th step just the first the next one what's the next one yeah so there have been a lot of situation in my life that it was all about what i survived today how i can today better or what would be my next step mm-hmm. and just focus on that and do it. And then it's magical when you do it and you, you, you pass the peak of the challenge, then mm. it become easier. It's always been like that. Yeah. Yeah. You're over that mountain and you can see the other side. Definitely. Definitely. Um, but again, it's, it's a mental game. Mm. Hey, and do you still like two minute noodles? Uh, <laughs> I do, I do. Um, I have, I buy Indomie sometimes, make it myself, and I. Um, it's it's funny. It's it's interesting. Um, sometimes um, sometimes I do some stuff that uh, looks a bit funny, but it's because of my memories. Mm. Uh, like I went back to Indonesia on Christmas, and a lot of my friends went there because they all went to America or were on the trip because of Christmas and New Year. And I was kind of alone, but I was just walking in the streets for hours and hours, just walking around and going to old places that I used to live and um, just, you know, sitting in a street food, having 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 noodle or nasi goreng and mm. going to these places that I used to go. And... Um, I was just, you know, contemplating what happened and where I am now and what's, what, what just happened. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's, yeah, reflection's important as well, isn't it? It definitely is. It definitely is. And tell me, your friend who you escaped with, uh, uh, do you know what happened to him? Um, from Iran? Yes. Uh, he, he, he lost in ocean. I believe he, he died in ocean. Yes. Oh, because gosh. We couldn't even find the dead body as well. Uh, because from 250 that 47 survived, they couldn't uh, find all the dead bodies as well. They just find like a, less than 100. So oh. I believe the rest were eaten, you know. Bye. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to yes. hear that, yes, sir. So com- coming to a close now, you know, organizations that are, are hearing this, you mentioned that you spoke at um, Microsoft and was it Cisco? and KPMG, uh, Social Good Summit and a couple of others. I mean, almost LinkedIn. <laughs> Great. So, so if I put your LinkedIn profile on the show notes and put a message out there to organizations to say, hey, come on, take action, um, have Yasser or Yasser and Devon come and speak to your organization and show you the, the power of the, the power of the pool potential of refugees and and what you can achieve together would that be okay definitely i would love that and that's a great support if we can do that um and i'm, I'm sure yvonne uh, would be happy as well we are really happy to come and share our stories and um, help if we can in any ways in that regard fantastic thank you yes sir uh, thank you so much um i don't know if there's anything and, and any sorry i didn't ask 
any other final words you want to share? Here's me closing you down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, there are a lot of people, I mean, the, uh, in my, especially part one, there are a lot of people in Indonesia who have helped me. Uh, I don't want to name them, you know, but uh, without them, especially back to hope, Without them, maybe I wouldn't be surviving. Without even, you know, and some of them even maybe didn't do a great deal of work for me, but just being there and listening to me or being there for me was a big, uh, big help. And they support me with, uh, with a lot, you know, and uh, give me a lot of hope. And even in Australia, the same thing. Uh, there are always people who come in a, in a right time and in a, in a tough time. Hmm. And I think one of the beauty of, I mean, I don't know how to say that, but one of the great thing about being a refugee is to find great people because yeah. you, you challenge a lot in, in your journey. And then in those challenging moments, there are people come to help you, help you, support you. And there are real friends and real people. And, um, I have, I have, um, I have, um, uh, met a few of them which I have them in my life now, and I'm really grateful for those. And also really grateful to be in Australia. Uh, I know our policies toward refugees and asylum is not, is not that great, but I also have to admit that uh, this country provided me with a lot of support. That's why where I am uh, today. Mm-hmm. Without that, I, it wouldn't be possible. So I'm really grateful and part of me going to society, community, speaking about my uh, refugee stories is uh, to kind of giving back in that sense. So, yeah, um, really grateful and thank you very much as to you as well because um, you know giving platform to mm-hmm. um, to my story to be to be uh, shared to be heard and uh, yeah, that's all from me. It's the least I can do. Yes, sir. Go well. Stay well. And I, for one, will be flying the flag to get you on as many stages as possible, uh, both in corporates and, and anywhere else where you can share your story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. And we hope that this conversation provided the insights and inspiration that you were looking for. Authentic Leadership is currently ranking fourth in the top 25 Australian leadership podcasts. We'd love you to help us get to number one and to get the key messages about modern day leadership out there. And this is how you can help. Head over to Apple iTunes and do three quick things. Subscribe, give us a positive rating and write a short review. Also, if you can follow us on Spotify and subscribe to the podcast on YouTube by visiting the at Being Brain Smart channel, we'd really appreciate it. And before you go, if you'd like to know what I do when I'm not interviewing amazing guests, I help people in business to lead better, work smarter, build great teams and thrive in change. To find out more, head over to the Brain Smart website. That's brain-smart.com to see examples of our programs or email me, Claire, that's C-L-A-R-E, at brain-smart.com. Go well and thanks for listening.